is the, and what we've talked about is the, I guess the uh, aesthetic autonomy, how to take some, some control over an intention over your personal aesthetic and how that can be, it's just such a signifier. Well, it connects me to a lot, a lot of things. Like um, either, for example, I never thought about the hair not being visual, for example. Mm -hmm. And when we think about uh, the body in the museum, for example, um, oh my God, that's short. <laughs> um, when I think about the, the the body in the museum. It never connects me exactly with the eyesight, per, per se. No? I feel the body and I feel that's a much complexer thing. But when I think about haircut or my aesthetic, it's only and only visual. How it looks like, how it, uh, the other one perceives, and not even me, but how the, the perception of the others th through me. So when you um, talk about uh, hair and energy, for example, or um, or pattern, mm -hmm. it's something that I do bring for the museum and I'm thinking, so the museum is a body as well, what about when you get into a museum and uh, we're not only towards what we're about to see, but uh, all of the things that will move inside of us, for example. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm talking about the body and autonomy and the museum. Um, I was thinking about the brain. We think sometimes, or it's it, the brain is, is thought about the organ that thinks. And there are some schools like cybernetics that think about the brain as the organ that make uh, that help us to deal with our feelings, with our feelings and with with systems like with life yeah. that is always changing, and we adapt to everything that is changing with this with the help of these organ and it's not the organ that just thinks. So when you go to the museum, you are going with your the whole body. You are not thinking, you are moving around and dealing with, for example, with ramps or with stairs or with uh, information and you, you are up there with all your body and you are perceiving. And you're being looked at. Yes. Yeah. That science is the end, like the, the, the end all, it's how to prove things, which makes me think about what you were talking about, and you guys did this a, a talk on, I think, right, with the, how, how language, and in terms of mental illness, and how people are perceived by a society, and what, what are the lines there, like, the way that I see it is it's, it's language, I mean, yes, there's behavior, but it's such a spectrum, but then when you put a definition on it, mm -hmm. you know, it becomes so, so limiting to that person. Mm -hmm. We did talk about that in the, in the talk, the autonomy of the craziness or something like that. Uh, I don't know how to translate it as well. Madness. Oh, oh the madness is a good word. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the questions, especially for Pavel, was like, uh, so at the point that you were diagnosed, I mean, that someone else tells you what your, your your body exactly. It uh, how does it affect you in a way that someone says, oh, just uh, like a disability is another super strong word. When someone tells you, oh, now you have disability, how does it affect you? Or even what they put you. And I, I think all those theories about uh, gender, race, critical disability, it's all about right. It's like a saying, so. Do I fit into this box? So does it mean that I have to behave like this? Just like I'm a woman, does it mean that I have to behave like a woman? Mm -hmm. And all this um, kind of loss or um, expectation from social behavior, 
someone is expecting from us and therefore I will uh, pressure myself to fit in. You know? Mm -hmm. Yes, and we do that all the time. And, and so in every relationship, I think, whether it's with our mother, our partner, or you know, whatever, you know, I think we are quite conditioned. I mean, it's part of our agreements mm -hmm. with each other. And what happens when we ask the questions or when we change uh, these references? Like, um, I love your work and uh, I, for me, seeing you, Lauren Klein, as someone that it's not someone who deals with uh, painting, sound, hair cutting, wigs, sculpture, it's not you if it's not connected. That's right. But one thing that um, it amazes me is is is, is that it? like um, why a haircut cannot be in a museum as a form of art? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. And I think historically, and I, I don't even know enough about I don't know enough about this, but it's such a ritual. And I'm, I mean, I'm working towards that in my practice is is ritualizing this moment. It's a sacred moment that you're having with yourself. It's a decision, it's a visualization. I really see it as an opportunity, as like a, a practice of, of possible futures. And you have this relationship with somebody who's changing your aesthetic, changing the way you're interacting with yourself when you look at yourself in the mirror, changing the way that the rest of the world is interacting with you when you walk down the street. And it's incredibly powerful. And the, I think that the most, it's, 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 there's so much potential for, um, creating both empathy for yourself in those moments as well as like a real clarity about how you want to see yourself, even even if it's just for the next, you know, well, I mean, the haircut is so thorough, right? It's like it starts changing immediately. <laughs> <laughs> um, 